My primary reference for the interpretation of fringe patterns is in a dual book from the 1950s titled The Science of Precision Measurement. There are two editions of this book with some content variation, but either edition is very helpful. Dual provided a wide range of metrology equipment as well as excellent literature on the subject. Leighton Wilkie, Dual's founder, was dedicated to technical education as well as manufacturing, and there's much innovation in Dual's products as well as their literature. In the following discussions, we'll use some of the illustrations from this book in combination with work under a monolight in the CAD models. A little later, we'll discuss what Dual calls their scale method, a graphical method of extracting quantitative surface contour data from fringe patterns. This dual monolight uses a helium fluorescent source with a diffuser. This light is versatile. It tilts and permits placing parts on the platen or swiveling the light to inspect parts on the bench. Should you come across this model, it's worth noting the compartment under the platen. If you're really lucky, you might find an optical flat inside. I had hopes, but found only a brochure in mine. I've recently acquired several editions of a later Dual book that builds on the earlier material, and references to the Dual books and a few other sources are included in the description under this video. We've seen examples of the air wedge formed when an optical flat is tilted and suggested that it's useful, so let's look at it more carefully. Here's Dual's illustration. The wedge angle is actually very small, on the order of tens of arc seconds, usually no more than an arc minute but the angle of view may be closer to that shown in the illustration. Dark bands, the fringes, occur each time the distance from the optical flat to the part is a multiple of a half wavelength. Let's define the contact of the flat to the part as the hinge, the location about which the wedge angle rotates. We'll typically identify the hinge in red, and it may be a point, a small area, or a line, depending upon the contact geometry. Now there's something interesting about this illustration. The part is flat, but two fringes are formed in the illustration, and more would form if we extended the sketch to the right. As we discussed earlier, the fringes don't correspond to variations in the part surface height alone. This surface is flat, but there are multiple fringes. The fringes correspond to the spacing between the part and the optical flat, combining part surface geometry and the rise of the optical flat. So, don't assume that multiple fringes suggest a flatness error when there's an air wedge. Here's a CAD model and fringe pattern for a perfectly flat gauge block with the hinge along the short edge. And here, the hinge is along the long edge. We get the same result with near-perfect gauge block under a monolight. Here, the hinge is along the short edge. As we change the wedge angle, the number of fringes changes, but in all cases, the fringes for a flat surface have three characteristics, which we'll call rule one. The fringes generated by a flat surface are straight, parallel, and equally spaced. Any deviation from these criteria indicates an error in flatness. If we tilt the flat on this corner, tilting at a compound angle, the fringes form diagonally. Still, the fringes for this flat surface meet the flatness criteria. They're straight, parallel, and equally spaced. So, in its simplest form, inspecting for flatness with an air wedge, a tilted optical flat, immediately tells us whether the surface is flat or it isn't. If the fringes aren't straight, aren't parallel, or aren't equally spaced, there are flatness errors. And if the surface isn't perfectly flat, the next trick is to determine how a region of the surface is changing, whether it's lowering or rising at any point along a fringe. Let's develop some rules that give us this information. Here's a top view of a CAD model simulating a tilted optical flat on the surface of a gauge block. Rule 1 tells us that the overall surface isn't flat. The fringes aren't straight for their entire length. But consider breaking the surface into two regions. All of the fringes in this region are straight, parallel, and equally spaced. This region is flat. And the same is true for this region. It's flat since all fringes in the region are straight, parallel, and equally spaced. The overall surface is composed of two smaller flat regions. Since these regions share a common edge and each fringe is continuous, we can assume that the second region is just tilted from the first along the common edge. We'll confirm that in a moment. But we still don't know which way the second surface is tilted, whether up or down. And we don't know how much it's tilted. 
Let's add an isometric view of the block. The second surface is just a simple chamfer with the outer edge below the first surface. If we envision the optical flat and half wavelength planes below it, it becomes clearer how the fringes are formed. Eliminating the flat and all but the fourth plane below the flat, we see the formation of one full fringe. Notice that the fourth plane generates the fourth fringe from the hinge. All the other fringes are essentially the same since the block has a constant cross section. Just to confirm that the continuous fringes indicate that the two flat surfaces are joined along a common edge, here's something similar but with a chamfer step below the top surface. Now the fringes aren't continuous, with the break in the fringes caused by the vertical step. This behavior is very unlikely for typical parts, but we'll see fringes like this later when we discuss comparing two gauge blocks. Back to the block with the simple chamfer. If we hadn't seen the 3D view of the block, we still wouldn't know which way the second surface tilts. Let's develop a rule that gives us this information. In the ISO view, begin at the point on the fourth fringe that's at the joint of the top flat surface in the chamfer. Now follow the fringe toward the edge of the chamfer. As the chamfer surface lowers, the fringe moves toward the hinge. This behavior is clear in the top view as well. It makes sense since the fringe represents a plane that's equidistant from the optical flat. As we move toward the hinge, the wedge height decreases, so the plane that forms the fringe must be dropping to maintain a constant distance from the flat. This leads us to rule two, which is, a surface is lowering in a direction in which the fringe moves toward the hinge. This answers the question of the direction in which the second surface tilts. It's lowering toward the outer edge. It's a turned down edge. And applying rule two, we can reach this conclusion looking at only the top optical flat view. Rule three is just the converse of rule two. This time, start at the point where the fringe meets the outer edge of the chamfer. Now follow the fringe toward the top surface. The fringe moves away from the hinge as the surface rises. Rule three is, a surface is rising in a direction in which a fringe moves away from the hinge. So rule two and rule three can both apply to the same surface. It just depends upon where you start on the fringe and the direction you move along the fringe. Now we know that the second surface is flat and tilts below the top surface but we still don't know how far the edge of the chamfer drops below the top. We don't know the chamfer depth. In this case, the chamfer depth is 36 micro inches. Let's develop a method of measuring this dimension with a tilted optical flat. To do that, we need a scale to make the measurement. In the side view, the half wavelength planes below the optical flat provide a scale relative to the bottom of the optical flat. The planes define a scale graduated in 12 micro inch increments below the optical flat. Now consider the intersections of these planes with the top of the gauge block. Think of the top of the gauge block as a reference plane. For example, the fourth plane from the optical flat intersects the top of the gauge block here, forming this fringe in the top view. These intersections map the scale in the side view to a magnified scale in the top view with each graduation in the top view scale representing a 12 micro inch increase in distance from the optical flat to the top of the block. While the fringes combine the effects of the optical flat rise plus the rise or fall of the block surface, in this case the block surface is flat, so the scale is a measure of just the rise of the optical flat relative to the block's top surface. It's a reference scale using the top of the block as a zero reference plane. With the number of fringes shown here, it might be possible to make measurements accurate to about a tenth of a wavelength if the fringes were clearly defined. We'll now use the scale to measure block surface deviations from this reference plane, in this case to measure the depth of the chamfer. Let's focus on the fourth fringe from the hinge, highlighted here. The top of the block is 48 micro inches below the optical flat here. And as we follow this fringe toward the outer edge, the chamfer remains 48 micro inches below the optical flat all along the fringe since the fringe is created by a plane 48 micro inches below the optical flat. The end of this fringe, at the end of the chamfer at this horizontal location, 
aligns with the 12 microinch mark on the scale. At this point, the top of the block is 12 microinches below the optical flat, so the edge of the chamfer is 48 microinches minus 12 microinches below the top of the block. It's 36 microinches below the top of the block, and that's the depth of the chamfer. Another way to look at this is to move the scale so its zero mark aligns with the end of the fringe at the edge of the block. Then the scale measures the depth of the chamfer directly, again giving 36 microinches. And yet another way to think about this, and the way that's often most convenient, is to just start at the fringe on the reference plane, then count fringes toward the hinge. The end of the fringe at the edge is three fringes toward the hinge. That's 36 microinches. So the chamfer depth is again 36 microinches. At this point, you probably wonder why I didn't just present the last method and be done with it. And that's a fair observation. The reason is that it will be helpful to understand the lead-in illustrations later when we develop the do-all scale method, which is useful for more complex surfaces. Beyond that, I just needed to think through the lead-in information to be sure that the last method is justified. Now what if we hinge the flat on a long edge of the block? While the fringe pattern hinged on the short edge gave us a rough feeling for the surface shape and was fairly easily interpreted, this pattern seems less informative. The surface still isn't completely flat since rule 1 isn't satisfied. Even though the fringes are all straight and parallel, not all of the fringes are equally spaced. We can't apply rules 2 or 3 since the fringes are all straight and parallel to the hinge. None bend toward or away from the hinge. Here, it's the fringe spacing that describes the contour, and this requires new rules, which we'll postpone at this point. For now, just realize that the selection of the hinge location can be important, and for many surfaces, there's a best location to easily evaluate the surface contour. For this block, the short hinge is best, and hinge locations that permit using rules 2 and 3 are usually a good choice. Let's take a real example and apply the rules. It's one of these 3 inch diameter lapping plates near the completion of the generation process using plate to plate lapping. Here's a fringe pattern with a fairly large wedge angle, creating many fringes. At first glance, the fringes look pretty straight, parallel, and equally spaced. There's little evidence of fringe distortion in a few places, but all in all, it looks pretty flat. But now, decreasing the wedge angle to decrease the number of fringes, some overall fringe distortion and variation in fringe spacing is evident, so it's definitely not perfectly flat and doesn't precisely satisfy rule one. Notice that this cast iron plate isn't very reflective and has poor surface finish, so the fringes become more difficult to define as the wedge angle decreases. As we select fewer fringes to improve the resolution of the deviations from flatness, but this is a good example of teasing useful information out of a poor fringe pattern. Always begin by identifying the hinge since the rules require knowing the hinge location. Now imagine a line joining the endpoints of a central fringe. Start at one end of the fringe and move toward the center. The fringe is moving closer to the hinge toward the center, so rule 2 applies. This means that the surface is lowering toward the center. The same is true starting at the other end of the fringe. So the central region is the lowest portion of the surface. The surface is concave. Let's add a little more detail. Start by roughing in best guesses for the fringe shape, marking the ends and a few points along the poorly defined fringe. Also mark the ends of the next fringe above this one. Draw a line between the ends of the central fringe, a line between the ends of the next fringe, and a line parallel to these, just kissing the maximum distortion of the central fringe. It's clear that the central region is closer to the hinge than the ends, as we guessed before, confirming that this region is concave. To measure the depth of the concavity, use the distance between the two fringes as a scale. We need only two fringes, since the fringe curvature is less than the distance between two fringes. The scale is 12 microinches long, and we can mark the center 6 microinches for reference. The fringe bends a bit less than 6 microinches, so a reasonable estimate might be that the depth of the concavity is a little less than 6 microinches. Let's say it's 6 microinches to be conservative, and account for the difficulty reading the fringes.
That's about a quarter wavelength, which isn't bad for a lapping plate, and six micro-inch precision isn't bad for a fringe pattern. That's about as terribly defined as we'd hope to interpret. Let's look at a CAD model to confirm our interpretation. This disk has a five micro-inch spherical concavity, scaled 10,000x vertically. It's a little difficult to see in the ISO view, so let's section it to make it clearer. Tilting the optical flat on one edge, here's the fringe pattern that results. Following a fringe from an edge toward the center, the fringe moves toward the hinge, so rule 2 says that the surface is lowering toward the center. The surface is concave. Again, establish a scale to measure the depth of the concavity. And finally, identify the position of the fringe at the center and estimate its movement toward the hinge. It's about four tenths of a fringe, about five micro inches, which is the depth of the modeled concavity. We could apply the same process for fringes away from the center, and we'd see that the depth of the concavity decreases toward the edges, which we'd expect for a spherical concavity. What if we hinge the optical flat at other locations? Regardless of the hinge location, the fringes always bend toward the hinge when moving from an edge toward the center. Rule 2 always applies, with the center the lowest point. We now have enough information to characterize the entire surface as concave, and, since the fringe shapes are the same for any hinge location, we know that the surface is axisymmetric. For this surface, we might have considered just laying the optical flat on the disk edge, using the optical flat parallel to the nominal disk surface with no wedge. Let's do that, but for a disk with 40 micro-inch concavity. In the top view, the red circle would show as a fringe, and, since there isn't any dark region in the center, a high spot, we can assume that the surface is concave. In the side view, we see that three half-wavelength planes intersect the concave surface, and three fringes form in the top view. At 12 microinches per fringe, that's 36 microinch concavity depth, and the inner fringe is a little shy of the center, so we might estimate about 40 microinch concavity, which is correct. This is a case where the top of map analogy works. But what about our lapping plate with only about 5 microinch concavity? Now, no planes below the optical flat intersect the surface, and we'd see only a circular fringe at the edge with no internal fringes. We can conclude that the surface is concave, since the optical flat touches only the outer edge, and since no more fringes appear, we can conclude that the concavity is less than 12 microinches deep. But that's the best we can do. This is a good example of the value of tilting the optical flat if we're interested in flatness errors of just a few microinches. Tilting the flat magnifies flatness errors, and we can adjust the magnification by adjusting the tilt angle, the angle of the air wedge between the optical flat and the part. In the next video, we'll discuss some real-world considerations related to monolites and optical flats. Then we'll continue exploring the interpretation of fringe patterns for more complex surface contours.